Good morning. Good morning. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. Last week we saw concerning the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that were going to be preaching the gospel uh, during the tribulation period. And uh, <clears throat> we saw that they came out of the 12 tribes of Israel. But I want you to notice this morning uh, that the Bible says in, our, in chapter 7 that uh, they were sealed, verse 3. These servants had a seal upon them. And I want to speak about that this morning and other things. So, Father, we just thank you today for the Word of God. Thank you, Father, for the heart of worship. We love you, Lord. We thank you that we can come into the house of God and meditate upon you and repair our hearts so that we can be ready, uh, Holy Spirit, to you to speak to us through your Word. Bless the Word of God this morning, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When you look at these 12 tribes and 144 messengers that came out of there that preached the gospel uh, during the tribulation period, I want you to notice the Bible says that they were sealed. What is the nature of that seal is the question. Well, well we are not told what the seal looks like. It just says they were sealed. What it consists of, we don't know that either, but we find in Revelation chapter 14, turn over there a minute, in verse 1, Revelation chapter 14, and I want you to notice verse number 1, And behold, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. So probably that's what the seal is. Interesting, isn't it? And don't you find it also interesting that perhaps this is where the devil got his idea by putting the mark of the beast on the yeah. forehead of his yeah. people? Yeah. That's just how the devil works. He copycats God. Well, if God can put a seal on his people, I'm going to put a seal on my people, Satan says. So they have a mark too, which is 666. We'll learn later on. What is the significance of this seal? Well, in Scripture, a seal means three things. Number one, a seal is a mark of ownership. When there was a seal put on somebody, a slave or anything like that, they were marked with a seal, with a slave with an earring uh, in the ear. And uh, per, so that was their seal, their mark, uh, to uh, know that they were a master slave forever. Also, you know, the Roman, all the Roman Empire, anybody who was a king in authority, uh, if something was sent out by letter, they had a seal. The, uh, yeah. Today, we do the same thing when we want to notarize something. You take it and you get, you get and there's a, a circle seal there. So, so it's a sign of ownership. It's a sign that it belongs to you. And so the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, they, they were of God. God picked them out of the 12 tribes of Israel and marked them and said, These are my people, my evangelists, and they belong to me. Me. Just like when you became born again, the Bible says in John 1, 12, But to as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. That's your seal. Amen. You are a child of God. And the second seal, the Holy Spirit Amen. who dwells in you is that seal of redemption. Yes. You own, you are owned by who? God. God, you, we are not our own. We belong to Him. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Since we belong to Him, He knows how to take care of us. Amen. Amen. He knows how to clothe us, feed us. He knows what's good for us. And He, and he takes care of us perfectly well. Amen. Amen. Sign of ownership. God marks these Jews as a special possession. Secondly, a seal protects. Look at Matthew 27 for a second. In Matthew chapter 27. And I want you to notice uh, verse 66. Matthew 27 verse 66. The Bible says here. Let me get over there. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, what? Sealing the stone and setting a watch. 
So when they sealed our, uh, our Lord's tomb, that meant what? They were there, it was sealed, and they were there to protect that seal in case anybody came to try to steal away the body of Jesus Christ. So they sealed it. Also, you don't have to turn here in Esther chapter 3, verse 12, 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 8. A seal is a mark of authority. Anybody who had a seal on him was a mark of authority. And so we find that God authorizes and authenticates that these 144 Jews and that they are his special servants sent out by his authority. Nobody could stop them unless God allows it. And so, the, praise God today that you who are born again this morning, praise God that Jesus Christ lives and reigns within us. Amen. Amen. He sealed us until the day of redemption, Ephesians says. And praise God, He owns us. He is our authority. Make it simpler terms, Jesus Christ is our boss. Amen? And we're his servants. It's that simple. Now I want you to notice also the multitude that comes out of the great tribulation, beginning in verse number 9 all the way to verse 17. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and psalms in their hand, palms in their hands. And they cried with, cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which array in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest? And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And therefore as they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light or them or any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I want you to notice this, 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 what's described here. Notice... It's immediately after the sealing of the 144,000. The multitude can be nothing else than those who believe the witnesses of the Jewish evangelists, and they were martyred for it. They were, they were killed for it. Turn with me to Matthew 24, just for a second. In Matthew chapter 24, I want you to notice verse 14. Matthew 24... The Bible says, Jesus is uh, predicting here the future. And notice here that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations and them that shall the end, what? Come. Did you notice that verse? Christ's commission to the twelve disciples here. When you look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 23, it looks beyond the time of Christ's earthly ministry. He's talking about future here. All right? And then in Matthew chapter 10, turn to Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, I want you to notice verse 17. Matthew 10, 17 says, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to counsels, they will scourge you in the synagogue, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for the testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought or how what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you the same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in 
you, and a brother shall deliver up brother to death, and father a child, and children shall rise up against their parents, cause them to put them to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be what? Saved. Now that Greek word saved does not mean salvation. It's talking about deliverance from the persecution. So when you compare Matthew 24, Matthew 10, 17 through 22, this did not occur during Christ's earthly ministry. This is still future. When you get down to verse 23, it can only apply to the time of the tribulation just prior to Christ's return. And that's what you have here in our text in Revelation here. So... The Jewish evangelists during the tribulation will probably be able to do miracles just like the apostles did. They're going to do the same type of miracles. We know that from Matthew 10, 8 and Luke chapter 10 verses 1 through 20. And so these 144 evangelists are going to do great miracles and just like the apostles did during that time, during their earthly ministry. And here's the point I want to make. The gospel of the kingdom is the message that Christ preached when he showed himself to the Jewish nation as their Messiah. Did he not say that he, that, well, he preached forth the what? The kingdom of God is at hand. It's the same message during the tribulation period. He warned them to repent, but what happened? They rejected the Messiah. When Christ was rejected by Israel, he turned to the Gentiles. Amen? Aren't you glad? Amen. We're Gentiles. We're not Jewish. So it's kind of sad and yet happy at the same time. It's sad that the Jews said, no, we don't have nothing to do with you, Christ. So he went to the Gentiles and we gladly received him. Praise God. There's not a born-again Christian in this room that should never be upset with the nation of Israel. If it wasn't for the nation of Israel, we wouldn't, have a, we wouldn't be saved. We wouldn't have a Messiah. We wouldn't have a Savior. We wouldn't have the Word of God. It's all because of the Jews. We got all that. That's why the Bible says in Romans, we were grafted in and we've been adopted into the family of God. Amen? So every time you witness to a Jewish person, you can tell them, hey, I'm Jewish. Yeah, that's right. And you're not lying. That's right. that's right. Because we are part Jewish. We got adopted yes. into the Jewish nation. Yes. And we got saved. Yes. So what happened? They rejected the gospel. And so they turned to the Gentiles. And from that point on, when Jesus sent it up into heaven, that's when the church age began. We're in the church age right now. We're preaching the gospel, people are getting saved, and churches are being built and planted. This is known as the church age. Now, he was not caught by surprise at his rejection. Jesus wasn't. It was prophesied in Scripture. So now Israel has been put aside until the church age is over. When the church age is over, we'll be raptured up during that time. Hallelujah. And then God's going to what? Go back? And, and minister to the Jewish nation again. We're not going to be here. We're going to be up in heaven. And during that time when he goes back to minister to the Jewish nation with the gospel of the kingdom being preached, that's during that tribulation period. We're going to miss that. Praise God. Now some believers don't believe that. They're, they're in theology, which is my thing, there are those in theology who don't believe in the pre- uh, rapture, pre-trib. I do. Uh, you can crucify me if you want. That's okay. I'll just grab you on the way up. Right? I'll just grab you on the way up. You can follow me, okay? So uh, I was debating one guy and I said, you know what? That's fine. That's fine. If you want to believe that we're going to go through the tribulation period, God will protect me during the tribulation too. That's right. Uh, tribulation is nothing new to born-again believers. We've, we've, been, we've, been, we've been persecuted and, and tortured and beaten all through centuries, amen? So it's nothing new to the believer. So if God wants to send me through the tribulation, I'm sure he'll take care of me. What's the worst that can happen? 
I get martyred, praise God, I'm, I'm up to heaven. It's all good. It's all good. So praise the Lord, amen. It's, it's all good. Now, what's interesting here too, in the meantime, for the last 2,000 years, the gospel has been preached to the ends of the earth. And a spiritual body has been created composed of the Jews and the Gentiles. That's today. Ephesians chapter 3. Turn over there. And Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That we, the Gentiles, so praise God that when we preach the gospel Sunday mornings, Sunday nights and Wednesdays, when people get saved, that, that the body, they enter the body, the spiritual body that Jesus is building right now. Amen. This uh, per, per, uh, parenthesis falls between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel in chapter 9. When the Gentile church is complete, God will restart Israel's clock and the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, will be fulfilled. Look at Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, the Bible says in verse 25, for I would, not I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceit. The blindness in part has happened to Israel. What's the blindness? The rejection of the Messiah. Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And, all, and so all Israel shall be saved. That is written, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So one day, Jew, Gentile, all will be fulfilled. All will be one in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But right now, Israel is rejected. That's why there's so many problems in the Middle East. Oh, if people would just believe the scriptures. See, this battle that goes on over in the Middle East with all these different countries, it is a spiritual war. Fought between two genealogies. Jacob and Ishmael. Ishmael we trace the genealogy of Ishmael. That's all the ISIS. That's all the Egyptians, Arab. They all believe Israel belongs to them. Remember Arafat and all that organization, PLO? They believe Israel belongs to them. It does not. God said in Galatians, my promise is in Isaac. They're not going to get the land, but that's why they're battling right now. The two genealogies are battling. And in poor nations, they don't realize they're getting sucked up into it. That's yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. a spiritual war, people. Mm -hmm. And it won't get settled until Jesus plants his two feet on the Mount of Olives. Yeah. Then it'll finally get settled. That's right. mm -hmm. Until then, there's always going to be wars yeah. mm -hmm. and war and war and war in the Middle East. It'll never get settled until the Prince of Peace comes. Amen. Amen. So just keep looking for more trouble over there. Because it's, it's not going to stop. It's that simple. It's a spiritual warfare. I 
when you look at the Gentile, the church, when it's complete and everything's fulfilled, here's the point. At the time of the Lord's focus will be again upon Israel and the establishment of the kingdom promised in the Old Testament. And the Jewish evangelists will go forth preaching repentance of the kingdom of God is at hand. In our text in verse 9 and 10, notice the multitudes come from all nations and what? In verse 9, tongues. God loves the world, the whole world, and desires to save all men. I marvel that God still preaches, lets the gospel be preached during this tribulation time. I marvel at that. He didn't have to. I mean, after all, they rejected the Messiah. After all, they've been persecuting the church for, for thousands of years. And now that the church is God, you would think, okay, I'm done with these people. But no, even so he sends 144,000 to preach the gospel of the kingdom. During the tribulation... God's wrath is poured out upon sinners. His mercy is still extended to those who will repent and believe. The only problem is back then, but during them, when they get saved, they're going to be martyred. We'll see later on in the chapters, the, the one world dictator will not allow that. Because he wants to be worshipped. He thinks he's God. And when they refuse to bow down to him, they're going to be killed. They're going to be killed instantly. That's kind of nice, really, in a way. I wish I would have got saved. God would have taken me home. Amen. That would have been nice. We have to fight the battle of the flesh anymore. <laughs> Save, boom, up we go. Boy, that'd be nice. <laughs> Notice the multitude is clothed in white robes, verse 9. This signifies, of course, the righteousness. Of Christ to the saints which was imputed to us and those who believe in Jesus Christ. Look at look at uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. In Romans chapter 3 I want you to notice verse 22. The Bible says here even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no what? Difference. Did you catch that? When you, when you put your faith in Christ, He imputes Christ's righteousness to you yes. and I. Yes. Yeah. In other words, when God looks at us, He sees righteousness. Amen. Praise God. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. Revelation chapter 7. And I said unto Sir, thou knowest, he said unto me, These are which came out of the great tribulation, have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. White. Righteousness. Same thing in Isaiah 61, verse 10. In your Old Testament talks about that. Praise God this morning that... We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. If God did not impute righteousness unto us when he got saved, when he looked at our hearts, all he would find is wickedness and sin. He wouldn't find anything good. Because the heart's no good, believe it. Amen? Pastor, my heart. No, it's good. No, it's not. Don't fool yourself. <clears throat> the heart is wicked, desperately wicked. Who knows it? Nobody really knows it except God. I've often said, I hear people use the quote Psalm, you know, David said, you know, search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. Be careful. Yes. <laughs> Be careful, because you're asking God to search your heart. Uh, you, you might not like what he reveals to you. <laughs> yeah, amen. It's good to know. But remember, when you ask Holy Spirit to search your heart, he will. And he'll expose what needs to be taken care of. Amen. 
And that's a good thing. And that's not such a bad thing. Notice here, also in verse number 9, the multitude hold palms. The palm branches were used in Jewish worship a lot and signified joy and thanksgiving and deliverance. Yeah, we, we came to a Jewish worship time. They held up the palms. They waved them back and forth in worship. Amen? God help us if we ever did that in a Baptist church. <laughs> you imagine walk in, and people have palms in their hands. I can imagine what go through their minds. But, it, but you know what? It brought joy. I, th I find it very interesting. Look at Leviticus chapter 23. In Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse number 39. Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse 39. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Ye take to you on the first day bows of goodly trees, branches of what? Palm trees. And the bow of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Days. Ye shall keep it as a feast unto the Lord seven days a year. He shall be a statue forever in your generation. You shall celebrate it on the seventh month. That's a weird way of worshiping, huh? Weird. <laughs> but it brought joy. Yeah. I don't know why we don't do it. We tried that here. We ended up probably worshiping palms. <laughs> you, know, man, you know how man is. Yeah. Yeah. You put a bunch of palms and trees in here, all of a sudden they'll be bowing down to yeah. them, you know? But, but they didn't do that. That was part of their festival. Yeah. It was part of their festival. That's all. Every time they saw a palm, it reminded them of God's blessing and joy. That's all it was. They didn't worship it, the branches. Here's the thing I want you to think of. Palm trees were also carved in Solomon's temple. And will be featured in the millennial temple as well. 1 Kings 6, Ezekiel 40, verse 16, 22, 26, 31, 34, and 37, you'll see the branch palm trees are carved into the temple. Why? Again, it's a remembrance how God blessed them, gave them fruit, and gave them great joy. It's just a remembrance, just like we do with the communion, just the remembrance. Notice also, verse 9 and 10, the multitude stands before the throne and before the Lamb, and they what? Worship Him, in verse 9 and 10 of our text. The Lamb is intimately associated with the throne of God and is worshipped as God, proving deity. Jesus Christ is God. The worship of God and the Lamb for, for their salvation, attributing it entirely to God. In other words, salvation is holy of God. Our salvation was finished when Christ died on the cross. Amen? Totally paid for. Aren't you glad today you don't have to pay for your salvation? Aren't you glad? You couldn't put a price on it. It's all been paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And that's why we worship. Yes. Our main joy in worshiping is to thank Him every time we meet. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. Free. If you come into the house of God, you can't think of what to worship. Well, I'll give you one. Yes. Think upon your salvation and give yes. him praise. That'll bring worship. Yeah. Worship. They worshiped him. 
Notice verse 11 and 12. Not all, but even the angels joined in. Wow! The angels love to worship God. They follow the lead and respond to the praise of the redeemed. Do you, you get the picture? The redeemed are there bowed down and worshiping God, and the angels said, We're just going to join in and do what they do. They just follow way along. Praise the Lord. They even praise God, the angels. Now, what's interesting here, though, they are not redeemed. Angels can't be saved because they don't have a soul. But, observing God's grace, they, the Bible says in Acts, do you realize that angels watch as the gospel being preached and they marvel when they see mankind accept Christ? They marvel at it. They look at that and say, wow, look at that. That's what they're doing here in heaven. Wow, look at these redeemed people praising God and worshiping God. I think we'll just join in with them. They marvel at that. 1 Peter 1.12 will tell you that. Notice here also the elders explain the scene to John. In verses 13 to 17, John's kind of confused when he looks at all this picture. And one of the elders is after saying unto me, that's John, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? John didn't get it. He, he asked the question, you know what's going on here? I have no clue, John says. <laughs> John does not know the answer to the elder's question and asks him to explain. Here we see 24 elders are knowledgeable about the will of God and the mysteries of God. We see here John's wisdom. You know what I like about John here? You see John's wisdom here? I don't get what's going on. So he's asking the elders for help. Who are more knowledgeable than him. Now that ought to ring a bell. <laughs> Look at Acts chapter 8. And Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 26. You see here this preaching in Gaza. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto a way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, and a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had in charge of all his treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Was he turning and sitting in the, his chariot and read Isaiah the prophet, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran hither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah, and said, Understand thou what thou what? Oh, uh-oh. The guy's reading. He doesn't what? Understand what's going on. John doesn't understand what's going on, so he's going to ask an elder who has more knowledge. He's going to tell him what's going on. Just like Philip finds this, uh, this guy, and he said, how can I accept man, some man guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him in the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led to sheep for the slaughter, lamb dumb before his ear, so open he gnawed his mouth. And in humiliation, and you know the story. So Philip the evangelist goes, explains what's happening, the guy, oh, I got it, gets saved and is baptized. Sometimes, as we grow in the Lord, sometimes we don't grow as fast as others do. There's no harm in asking somebody who's, who is more spiritual than you to explain something to you. Amen? I forget the two guys' name now, but uh, remember there was preaching going on? And, um, I think it was, I don't know if it was Peter. Ah, my mind doesn't comprehend it. Uh, anyway, they're preaching... And he says, have you heard about Jesus and the gospel? Have you heard about the Holy Spirit coming upon you and in you? And the people, oh, well, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And so what, what happened? 
They, there's no, we never heard of such a thing. So they had to go and what? Explain to them more what was happening. So there's nothing wrong with seeking spiritual help if you need it. Amen? So if you're in that place where you say, you know, I just don't get this, you can call me, you can call the elders, or you can call somebody who's been saved a long time. Maybe they have the answer, and they can explain it more to you. There's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, that's good. That shows humility. It shows that, you know, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. I, I'm still learning. There's some scriptures in there I'm still learning. I still don't get. Yeah, and I got all those degrees, you know what I mean? <laughs> Man, you know, I got that, you know, I got that, that graduate of theology and bachelor of theology and master of theology and doctor of theology, and I still don't know nothing. <laughs> I'm serious. Just because I have all those degrees, that doesn't mean I have all knowledge. I just got all those things for discipline. So I enjoyed the discipline of it. But you see what? <clears throat> this is where your knowledge comes yeah. from. Amen. Amen. You want to know God and how He works and how He thinks and what He does? Get in the Word. Ask the Holy Spirit will teach you. Yes. Amen? Amen. By the way, every one of you already have a degree. Right. You've, got, you've got a BA. Yes. You're born again. <laughs> See, that didn't cost you nothing. <laughs> Just because somebody has something on a piece of paper doesn't mean he knows it all. So I don't know it all. Matter of fact, I, I learned stuff a couple of weeks ago. He made a mark. I said, I never saw that before. In all my years, I, 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 I was driving home thinking, man, that's good stuff. I got to think about that. <laughs> I never thought about that. See, we can all learn from each other. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're just servants. That's all we are. Amen. That's it. Amen. So the elders here explain the scene to John in verses 13 through 17. And notice in <coughs> verse 14, they are saved during the great tribulation. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the... Lamb. Now, this is not church age saints. The church is the bride of Christ and is not seen until Revelation chapter 19. This multitude who are saved are a separate group of believers, they're not church age believers. And notice these, these people in verse 15, notice they served the Lord how long? Day and night. Day and night. In other words, forever. You see, we are not saved to sit or to do our own pleasure. We are saved to serve Christ who has purchased us with his own blood. Amen? Amen. We begin the service in the presence of life and continue throughout all eternity. When you got saved, you're saved to serve. Amen? Amen. You're not saved to sit on your rump. Mm -mm. Right. Amen. <laughs> now, you might get mad at me this morning, so get mad. Have roast pass when you get home. <laughs> I give you permission, okay? Yeah. But there are some believers that get saved, they do nothing. And there are some who get saved who are in retirement and they even retire from God. Yeah. That's wrong. Since when you turn 67 or whatever it is now, yeah, 66. <laughs> did I say, I'm, a matter of fact, I'm retired. You know, I can collect Social Security <laughs> in March. I'm retiring. So, elders, you're going to have to look for another pastor because mm. I'm retired now. <laughs> But that's the mentality of a lot of Christians today. Yes, I'm retired. Yes. I've done my duty. Let somebody else do it. Right. Huh? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if every member had that attitude? Mm -hmm. There'd be nobody here. Yeah. 
Especially if the congregation got a lot of elderly. You, you can never, people, I'm telling you, by the authority of Scripture, you cannot stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say to Him, well, Jesus, I retired at 67 from work, from church, from everything. I'm going to do what I'm going to do from now on. I've earned it. And God's going to say, who gave you the strength, the wisdom to get where you go? Yes, that is exactly right. You think you've got that on your own? That's right. Once you're saved, people, you never retire from God until He takes you home. That's just my two cents. Notice they serve the Lord forever. Imagine, can you imagine standing before the throne of God in eternity and saying, no, I'm not worshiping you today, Lord. I'm retired. <laughs> I don't think so. Notice verse 15. They dwell with God forever, too, to commune with God. Therefore, they before the throne of God serve Him day and night in His temple, and He that sit us on the throne shall dwell among them. That's communion. That's fellowship. What a great privilege this morning this is. Fellowshipping with the living God. What a privilege. Wow. Think, meditate on that today. What a privilege. And that is what salvation has purchased for us. This was his desire for mankind from the beginning. Adam walked and talked with God, but that fellowship was broken by sin. Now we see it restored to a much higher level. A higher plane. I guess if you want to use this term, you that are born again, if you seek a much higher level with God, you can say you're high-minded. <laughs> Better than carnal-minded. Yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah. Who do you think you are? Yeah. I know who I am. I'm in right. sweet fellowship with the living God. That's right. It doesn't get any better than that. Nope. We are blessed. Amen? Amen. Notice verse 16 and 17. They are blessed with every physical comfort and enjoyment. In this world, we often hunger, we thirst, are often too hot, too cold are often sad and lonely, downcast, but not in heaven. Amen? Ponder this this morning. We don't know exactly what it means to be led into living fountains of water. But we know that it will be very delightful. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Notice the living water. I don't care what kind of water it is. Salt water, fresh water. All I know is it's going to be nice. Yeah. It won't cost me nothing. <laughs> Just got my water bill. Man, in heaven, I'm not going to get a water bill. Lord. Praise the Lord for that. But I know one thing. The fountain of water of life is God. Amen. That's, all, that's all we need. Amen. The fountain of life is with God. It's all about Him. Revelation 22, 1. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Psalm 16, 11. Tells you the wonderful fountain of life and the enjoyment to be living with God. We serve a living God, not a dead God. Amen. Praise God. And notice in our text, God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. This means not only that He will cause all former sorrows to cease, but also that He will remove every future cause of sorrow. In other words, there will be no more, never again, suffering, pain, 
sickness, tribulation, loneliness, fear, threats, hatred, lies, betrayal, etc. No more. Isn't that exciting? No more. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Ah, what a day that's going to be. Amen. Amen. Nothing to worry about ever again. Okay, see, as human beings, we have, there's always one thing that I consider a pain in the neck. Is that we, we have a hard time forgetting those things in the past. The, the, the devil brings up the hurts, the sorrows, the pains, doesn't he? Praise God, mm -hmm. we're in heaven all wiped out. Amen. Never to come back again. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, I'll be able to think properly. <laughs> <laughs> I can finally think straight. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Heaven's going to be a great place. Amen. Amen. So in the meantime, we need to get that gospel out, minister in the town, because people need to hear the gospel, yes. Yes. and they need to be saved <coughs> so they can enter heaven. Amen. 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 Next week, we'll look at Revelation chapter 8, and in Revelation chapter 8, you see Christ releases the first six trumpet judgments under the seventh seal and they're not pretty they're not pretty so in the meantime let's serve the Lord amen let's worship the Lord and by the way even worship on a Sunday morning as it gets better and better and it is it's still not perfect worship. It's really the best we can do is sinners saved by grace. Just think when you get to heaven, we're going to fall down for the first time and worship properly. Wow. I can't imagine what that's like. No more Satan to bug us. No more Satan to put thoughts in our mind. All gone. No distractions at all. The only one that's going to distract us is the Lord Jesus Christ. As we bow down and say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for this day. And Lord, if there's one here that's not saved, may they come to the Savior this morning, realizing that Sin pays a terrible price. The price is death. Death without Jesus is separation from God for all eternity. I pray that they'd repent this morning of their wicked ways and ask Christ to come into their heart. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.